Well, hello to the Smart Brown Girl Book Club. I am very excited for our second, this is our second author chat. There has been so much discussion. Hood Feminism was our May read. We're gonna cross our fingers, light all the candles, say all our prayers that there's no technical difficulties, but it's okay, because if my camera goes out, you're not really here to see me. We're here to talk with Mickey Kendall, which is so amazing to have you. We really like, you know, part of the founding of the Smart Brown Girl Book Club was about um, creating, well, our tagline is creating a spaces for the first, what is our tagline for the girl for the black girls in the forgotten spaces for the black girls in the forgotten spaces right because one of the things i noticed on twitter and i've been talking a lot about this with the advent of like amplify black voices is we still amplify along socioeconomic lines and we talk a lot about black poor black women but we not we do not include them we do not make things accessible to them and so this book is just so in line with the themes of the smart brown girl book club so we really appreciate the opportunity to have you here for this discussion all right so we already have most of our questions that were submitted by the book club audience thank you we're gonna give i'm not gonna move too fastly because folks are logging in the numbers are like rolling up now hello to everybody um but we had so much discussion in the book club because i think so many of members of our community really resonated with feeling like they were seen but also the way you challenged us to think broader you challenged us to give more grace and to be more considerate of others. And so um, we really just appreciate all of the discussion that this book brought and that it sold out. We were happy to participate. Oh, she froze. Hold on. We were doing our, our formal introduction and we were congratulating Mickey Kendall on uh, her, what she just got her book numbers in and that we were very happy to participate in helping the book to sell out. It's a great read. Okay. so. If someone could just comment and let me know that y'all can see and hear us and we're good, but we're gonna get into the questions. So to start, what's been the hardest part in being a black woman and making it in the book industry? So one of the things is that people will tell you over and over again what you cannot do. They'll tell you that you're doing it wrong, that no one wants to read this, that you're not presenting yourself the right way. I'll never forget back way back in 2013 when I did the hashtag solidarities for white women, there was no shortage of people telling me I had just killed my writing career. I didn't even have a writing career yet. I was just someone who had a regular government job, went nine to five every day and did this on the side, but I had killed my career. And the first thing you have to learn is that, and this is a t-shirt slogan, but also a fact, People who are afraid to follow their own dreams will always try to discourage you from following yours. People who don't want your dreams to come true will try to discourage you. People who just can't imagine what you can will tell you that what you want is impossible. And you just have to tune all of that out. Like your first fan has to be you. You have to believe in yourself more than you believe what anybody tells you about yourself. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's very true. And I do feel like we as black women just, we face an extra layer of people being so ready to tell us. Like I remember how many, like how many times throughout my education was I told that I wasn't gonna make it because I talked a certain way, I presented a certain way. You know, like being in like sixth grade and having your English teacher tell you you can't be a writer. And I'm just like, girl, I'm 12. Why are you telling me that? Like that's so disrespectful. I was in grad school and I had um, the chair of uh, my department tell me that no one would hire me writing the way that I do. Mm. I was already published when she told me that. So I just, okay, sis. <laughs> and sometimes that's all you can do. Sometimes you just have to look just, at people and know. And then like, keep on going and nice. keep on moving. Yeah, right. they, they've made their mind up about you. Okay, mm -hmm. so. The next question is based on your chapter. Solidarity is still for white women. I actually don't know what paragraph they're pulling from, but the, the question was submitted that you, you led this person to believe that real feminism, like united with white women, does not exist. So is it fair to call oneself a partial feminist? And just to add some um, 
context to this, in the space of like where I live at and where much of my audience is coming from on YouTube, there is a, a constant push against feminism, though it invokes the language of black feminism. And I don't know that everyone necessarily has the um, context of the history of womanism and black feminism and how that might differentiate from capital F feminism. And so sometimes they're left without the language to say, well, I want to work for my people, but I feel excluded from this side of the movement. And I feel like you address that within your yeah. chapter of your book. So here's the thing. I think that, you know, when we're talking about feminism and identifying, I call myself an occasional feminist sometimes, right? Especially if the conversation in mainstream feminism has turned to say last names and whether or not changing your last name is feminist or if lipstick colors are feminist enough. I don't care. I can't be made to care. That is not a feminism that has anything to do with my day-to-day -day life. I think, though, when we're talking about womanism and black feminism and, and hood feminism, you know, community-focused feminism, I think a lot of black women have already reached the point where we're already working. We're already trying to keep our communities healthy and afloat. We're already taking care of kids and elders and all of these things. And we have to prioritize our own sanity and safety and that of those that we care about and our survival and that to me is the real feminism to focus on and it's not like it's just black women that are having to do this little dance you see this with indigenous feminists you see this with muslim feminists a lot of people who are outside of this upper white middle class sort of range of capital as capitalist feminism are having to figure out how to make a way out of no way and that's where solidarity can live do I think you can find solidarity with someone who, say, really admires uh, the racism that's pouring out of the current administration? Well, no, you're gonna have to leave her behind. Some folks just don't get to get to freedom. Some folks are gonna have to stay where they are. Yeah, and I feel like you address this in um, Solidarity is for White Women that you, you say that it's not about solidarity being forever also, that sometimes we are gonna have different interests. Sometimes our interests are gonna align for a season, for a period, for an era, but then we're gonna realize that we have different prioritizations and we have to move in a certain direction, but it doesn't mean that we, you know, we might not be working as closely together, but that doesn't mean we have to become foes of each other. Right, the only time I feel like we really move into sort of what I would call enemy territory would be Right now, like all of the pro-cop posts that are coming out of a certain category of white women. I can't save her. I can't work with her. I'm gonna have to leave her on the side of the road wherever she is to face whatever is there. And I may not ever be able to trust someone that's been on that, that train. That does not mean I can't trust everyone else. It just means I've gotta be able to do that categorization in my head of, is this worth it? All right, moving into the next question. What advice would you give to a black woman in her 20s wanting to embrace her black feminism in spaces where it's not widely appreciated or only appreciated when it is a benefit to others and their needs? I would say that there's nothing wrong with being selfish. That even though people will tell you you exist to be their mule, right? Zora Neale Hurston gave us the language for this. I'm not your mule, I'm not your mammy. There are people, sure, who you will willingly choose to take care of because they take care of you, right? When I'm talking about solidarity and having each other's back, this should never be a one-way street. So for a young woman in her 20s, if the people who are always calling you for something, the people who always need you to do something never show up for you, that's a person to leave behind. Right. You're looking for a mutual aid society in your life, in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s. And I acknowledge I'm 43. I have definitely reached that lack of give a damn. The field of my fucks. We can barren. curse. It's OK. <laughs> OK. Good. You have field, no yes, fucks left my, to give. <laughs> yes. Not one. There's not a fuck left. And one of the things I've learned is that the feminism that works best for me and the women I care about, young and old, is the one where you are expected to take space to take care of yourself, to be good, to reach out for help. Because if you're not taking care of yourself, then you burn out. That mask has to go on your face first before you can help anybody else. 
Very, very true. All right. So your book discusses the importance of allies in regards to intersectionality of feminism. The incident in New York City with Amy Cooper is a reminder to the already known reality of how white women collectively view black people. Do you have recommendations on how to navigate the feminist space in light of these realities of white women like Amy Cooper? So I have what I call the reference requirement. Um, if no one I know knows you, if no one I know works with you or deals with you, we're, I'm going to take their advice. There's that. Then with strangers or someone who is accosting you or whatever, I'm going to say flat out, not that we should always knock some sense into someone, but don't feel obligated to try to prove your worth to this person, to try to make things better with them. Because, again, some people, they're just lost. Whatever is wrong with them is their business. It's not your business. You are not their therapist, their mother, their sister. You owe them nothing. You owe them absolutely no part of yourself. So if that means you walk away, if that means you file that formal complaint with HR, if that means they get to go viral, all of those things are fine. Because again, you can't look out for anyone else if you're not safe. So that would be my advice, especially in feminist spaces, because there are going to be some people where you're going to hear and see things that tell you early on, right? This is one of those times, I hate to say it, your mom and your grandmama was right. You can't trust everybody. <laughs> okay, so our next question is based off of your chapter, Fear and Feminism. This was a, a hit in the group. So it's actually the last paragraph on page 170. I'm going to read it just so we all have a little context. You say white supremacy isn't just about normalizing racism, but when white women help to maintain the status quo in a society that is dripping with white supremacy, they give themselves more power. Furthermore, because white women have historically centered their own concerns in every movement, their priorities have largely revolved around keeping themselves intact, safe and free. Though white women as a whole are far from politically homogenous, they do have families and social lives that involve heavy interaction with their political opposites. So would you say this is the reason why the All Lives Matter hashtag was established? All Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, all of these things are an easy way to say, to sort of mask your own racism, right? To mask your own complicity in, in racism. Because there's a weird narrative that start, has started to spring up more often now where white women are happy to point to white men as being the fountain of racism and give themselves permission to sort of be off the hook. And a lot of that then means they never have to confront, right? If I say all lives matter, I care about black lives, but really all lives matter. It's the equivalent of saying they're good people on both sides, right? The neo-Nazis, Okay, what they did was wrong, but there were good people over there. It's not a sentence that we should ever utter. We definitely heard people say it, but it's not a thing we should ever be uttering. But it's an easy way to sidestep confronting the reality because I think a lot of times the women and, and men will say those kinds of things. They're looking at that crowd with their tiki torches or whatever, and what they see is their brother, their nephew, their sister, their cousin, someone who they don't want to admit is a terrible person, right? Well, yeah, they're a little racist, but otherwise they were great. They weren't great, they were racist. Well, okay, so he beat his wife, but otherwise he was a great guy. He's an abusive jackal, right? So it's in that same range. Rather than confront reality, they write themselves this pass. Yeah, okay, so the question that I had on the screen, but wasn't asking, um, and this is connected to the previous question. You stated that white women aren't just passive beneficiaries of racist oppression, they are active participants. Can you speak on white women's current role in uplifting white supremacy and how, well, this is what the whole book says, how white feminism has excluded black women and women of color? So we're gonna go back to Amy Cooper for a second and we're gonna pair Amy Cooper. There's a teacher who attacked two women, a woman and her child walking back to her car and she claimed it was anxiety and I've forgotten her name, but let's call her Karen because it's all the same thing. What happens is that 
they're chasing a level of power for themselves to be equal with white men. And yes, yes, not all white women, all of the, the things that we want to tie into that. But for the ones that we're talking about, what they then see is every other woman is competition because the power they're chasing, they already know can't be shared. The power to oppress is what they're chasing, not the power to make things better for everyone. And if your goal is to be equal in, a, in being able to oppress others, well, you need people left behind to oppress, which is why you'll often see, you know, oh, well, racism really lives in low income white women. It really lives in low income white people from folks who are managing hedge funds, who are sitting in political offices, who are behind the podium at the White House, who are on TV, on The View, among other shows. And what they're really telling you is just ignore what I'm doing. Oh, you froze. So um, you're going to have to. Yes. OK, I'm here. You, I'm yeah, no, you, it was only for a second. So you were saying. Right. So the thing is, they know that what they're creating for themselves is an easy escape hatch, right? If I direct your attention over there and I tell you it's low income and it's the same trick on both sides. It's low income white people. It's low income black people. It's low income Asians or whatever. It's those people. And you just ignore that they, meanwhile, especially right now during COVID, $400 billion more dollars came out of the economy into these folks' pockets. Hmm. They made money. Everybody else lost their jobs, people losing their homes. So you have to know that these are white women who have plenty of power and are happy to use it against other people. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, we're going to move in because, you know, we could talk about the white women all day. But our next question is a little bit more personal and intimate to the black woman experience. So the um, SPG community member is saying that they've spent the last few years working in the black maternal health space, addressing infant and maternal morbidity, mor yeah, mortality. I've noticed a common trend, well, it's kind of about white women again, of white women having a white savior complex and black women who are of a higher socioeconomic status being hesitant to engage directly with black women experiencing homelessness, food insecurity, et cetera, all things which you would address as feminist causes in your book, right? So mm -hmm. these trends feel more covert. Where does one begin with addressing issues of the white woman as savior complex and wealthier privileged black women being hesitant to engage black women experiencing homelessness? So one of the things is that we have to dump the idea that poverty is a mortal sin, that someone is a bad person because they're poor, that someone has failed in some way. Because what happens is that people then, because it's a victim blaming narrative for, I'm, I'm gonna call it out, for especially for higher income black women who have never experienced homelessness or um, being food insecure and all of these things, they think that that woman must have done something wrong. I did all the right things, that's why I haven't experienced it. No, you just had more help you had family with a little bit more money. You had slightly better luck. There's 101 reasons why you're not struggling financially and someone else is. It has nothing to do with character or their intrinsic value as a person. And what we've got to get out of the idea of is that somehow those people, quote unquote, are taking away from you when they ask for help, when they need support. As a society, we're supposed to take care of each other. And specifically when it comes to black people, let's really keep it honest. The today's I'm financially comfortable is one to maybe three paychecks away from on the street, on average, right? Maybe you've got that six months worth of savings, but all it takes is one illness. And that's true for most Americans, but it's especially true for I black people. I always say we are one medical emergency away from poverty. <laughs> like it's it's yes. real. We we shed this veneer of wealth, this image of wealth on social media, but a lot of us are are very our 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 financial stability is fragile. Well, and this is one of the things because then because of your shame and your guilt, you're not helping her out. Meanwhile, the ego stroke of that white savior, which is often unfortunately not super helpful, right, requires them to have someone to ride in to save quote unquote. And then when they're bored or it's not easy, 
that person needs more than they're willing to give, away they go. And this person is still left without the community support that they've been left with probably throughout their life, right? So I'm gonna put myself here. I talk about this a little bit in the book. I come from a low income working class family raised by my grandparents largely. And my parents are kind of middle class, but not really middle class, all of that. And then I get divorced and divorce tanks my credit. I have a child who's two. So daycare eats up whatever money I'm earning, all of these things, right? I end up in the projects. I chose that because it was better. And at the time, safer than trying to continue dealing with an abusive ex and no community around me, right? But those safety nets are disappearing. So if you really want to ride in to save people, your riding in isn't you individually getting your Hallmark movie moment. Your ride in is at the voting booth, it's at with your politicians, it's at those boring municipal meetings where you vote to open sh shelters, to fund schools, to fund domestic violence centers. You, you want to save and you want to help. Well, that means creating a system where folks can access the resources continuously, not just for five minutes or five months, but across years. Yeah, it's like a lot of the support is is really, it's not small things, but it's not the things that look good on Instagram. It's not the things you right. can take a picture really of. Really good support is often invisible. Yeah. That's a good quote to remember, though. Even as we ourselves seek to help our community members, especially because right now there's this heightened about, like, what can I do thought. And I think a lot of people tend to think about what can I do and then post on Instagram, even if it's subconscious, even if it's subversive. But remembering that really the good things that we can do often are not going to be seen by the public. Right. All right. So the next question is, do you find it difficult having to become an ally or defendant for those marginalized spaces in which you were not familiar with in your upbringing or current life? And if so, how did you navigate that? And do you still have trouble and challenges now? Um, I had to get comfortable with being told I was wrong and listening to people who told me I was wrong. Um, there's a knee jerk defensiveness when someone calls you in, we'll say, and says that what you just said is, is a mess. And you have to get used to the idea that you should hear this person out. Now, sometimes people are mad at you for things that don't make any sense. I'm never going to remove the possibility of trolls. But more often, someone is saying, hey, what you said there, I like you, but what you said there was a mess. And years ago, uh, a trans friend of mine, because I said something about, you know, what's the big deal about bathrooms, right? But I lived in an area with a lot of those single-use bathrooms, not one of the places, Chicago's old, um, so not one of the places with the big giant stalls. Was It was less common to see those in most places. And my friend said to me, well, if we're out someplace and I can't go to the bathroom, then I can't go out. And it never occurred to me, and I don't have a good reason for this, but it had never occurred to me that there would be a point where you would not be able to access a bathroom that was safe for you, hmm. right? Yeah. Or at least nominally safe. And so my knee-jerk solution was, well, I will go into a bathroom with you. And she looked at me and she says, you know, I know that, which is why we're cool, but it would be more helpful if I didn't need an escort to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. and I was wrong and I apologize and if you ask me now I'm one of the first people to tell you that you need to figure out your issues with people in the bathroom stalls are great, urinals are not work it out, right <laughs> but it was one of those things where it had not occurred to me simply because my window was so narrow Right. Yeah. my focus was just here right I knew trans women are women, I know trans men are men, everything is cool. I don't think about the mechanisms of the day-to-day -day life, that you can be fired for being trans in some states. So all of these things can happen. And depending upon where you individually reside, it may not be a thing you know about and may not be a thing in your state, but you have to remember that you are not the center of the world. Your state, your city, whatever is not the center of the world. Yeah. yeah. So right on time, because you definitely, we really appreciate that it's LGBT 
LGBTQIA. You said I have the audio version and you hit it every time. I'm like, you know, you were very good at, you know, femme presenting and really giving language for all the diff the diversity of uh, gender presentation, of the spectrum of gender, of, you know, people being non-binary and how we can be inclusive of them um, when we talk about feminism. And so this particular question comes from, uh, the person watched an IG live with black women radicals and they were interviewing the creator of the Black Lesbian Archives. Ooh, I hope I don't mispronounce this name. Crew Mikado. The host mentioned, this is paraphrasing, that a lot of times we believe that black feminism is solely the work of heterosexual, and I would add cisgender black women. But we know that much of black feminism has been shaped by black lesbians, bisexuals, and queer women. I appreciate moments when you talk about transgender and queer folks in your book and would like to know, how do you think cisgender and heterosexual black women feminists can and should support their queer and black trans sisters in their work? Where do you see and situate the political thought of queer and trans black women in hood feminism? So I will say this. I feel like too often we get hung up on the idea that we need to lead, that we need to do the work other people are doing for them or tell other people how to do their work. And I would say that if you want to work with trans and gender queer folks, you should ask them what they want you to do. How can I help is a great question. And then follow instructions, right? Because sometimes just like you don't necessarily want someone in your life to jump in to solve your problems for you, you need them to help you do X so that you can do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Sometimes you need to ask first. You need to say, and especially this is true because in the hood, for the most part, you're going to encounter people who are walking all manner of roads in their life, who have a variety of gender expressions. Um, I lived in Hyde Park and South Shore. South Shore in particular is where the black LGBTQ community in Chicago largely resides. If you're going to work with people and they are facing a struggle you have no experience with, the easiest thing to do is to show up at the meeting, show up at whatever, and say, what do you want me to do? Do you need me to write letters? Do you need me to be the person that brings the food, the drinks? What will help you the most? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's this idea, like, well, as you were saying beforehand, like the ability to be okay with being wrong. And I think a lot mm -hmm. of us, particularly because of like the Twitter dragging, and the way going wrong on social media happens. And maybe we don't see as much. And I think we've gotten a little bit better at acknowledging when people go wrong the right way because they're open to being mm -hmm. corrected. They're open to learning. They're opening to put the labor behind their words and actually do better. Um, and so I, I understand the fear of going wrong because of the fear of being dragged on black Twitter, which nobody wants to do. <laughs> I've done to them. But, you know, in our interpersonal lives, right, like there's going to be plenty of times where we might be wanting to do good for the community, but we also need to hear that community, which is great because we're reading The Women of Brewster Place next. So it all connects to this idea of community and hearing. You know. Well, and I'll say this about the fear of being dragged and all of that. I'm sorry is the most magical phrase in the English language. <laughs> if you can manage, I'm sorry, I fucked up, I will do whatever it takes to make amends. If you manage those three sentences together, you'll notice that risk of drag turns off. That does, however, mean you then have to mean what you said. You have to genuinely mean, I'm sorry. I know I screwed up. Please let me make it up to you in whatever way would be appropriate for you. And people will often, because it's frankly such a shock when someone owns what they did and is willing to make amends, people will often be like, oh, okay, well, let's, this is what's wrong. And then you fix the thing, right? Thank you for correcting here. me. I actually appreciate that you cared enough to see me do better. Right. Like, right. Yeah. yeah. It, that's a great sentence. And you know what people do, take away from that? You care and you don't mean to do harm. Okay, great. Because often, unfortunately, people get so hung up on the idea, how dare you say I could be wrong, that they just keep screwing up. You don't have to double down. You don't have to pull a rowling and just keep digging yourself a hole as is happening today on the internet. 
Humility goes a long way. Okay. Um, oh, this is a different question I think I just put on the screen. Oh, no. Uh, in It's Raining Patriarchy, you write at the end, the second to last paragraph, we can't sacrifice the futures of black girls and femmes to preserve the futures of young toxic men or the institutions that made them possible. That is a drag. Patriarchy has no gender. Yes, all those things. Um, so the question was, how do black masculine of center, center cisgender women and black transgender men and trans masculine folks fit into this conversation about patriarchy and toxic masculinity? How do we hold them accountable for their, at times, toxic, toxic masculinity while holding space for the very real violence they, like cisgender black men, experience, but because they are gender non-conforming? That is a heavy question. So I would say start to talk to them about what your problem is with them. And, and I mean that in a, you're not in a you're so wrong and here's where you screwed up way. But the thing I do, I have teenage sons and I spend a lot of time around young teenage black men. Um, and Lord, that's a journey in and of itself. Um, so sometimes you have to ask them questions because they don't really know why they think the way that they do. Someone taught it to them. No one's ever challenged it or no one's ever given them space to explore why what they said is making people withdraw from that. Right. And sometimes it's pretty straightforward and kind of like holding up a mirror. One of my favorite things when they when the conversation turns to clothes, for instance, and who's wearing what and victim blaming about sexual assault. I bring up the police and hoodies and that narrative about respectable clothes will protect you and then walk them. And this is for people you love, not necessarily for strangers. Right. Like you may not want to do this with everybody, but walk folks through how what they said sounds. Hold up that mirror to show them that they sound like the people they claim to hate or to be afraid of, the people who are a danger to them. And you know, this is not easy work. This is not a single conversation. I'm assuming that at this point that these are conversations you're having with someone you really want to see do better. And, and explain to them what your problem is and why. Calmly, right? This is like I said, this is not yelling. But if you're willing to do the labor, give them that space to grow and to change. Because you'll be amazed by how often in the conversation you start to figure out that what they're imitating is what they've seen. It's not even necessarily what they deep down believe. That's not gonna be 100% true, but I've noticed this especially with the 19, 20, you know, some, somewhere around 14, like 22, especially for young men of color, mm -hmm. the messaging that pours in is so toxic and it's almost unrelenting. And yeah. then when you, talk to them they're like I guess I never thought about what that would mean I had a kid tell me once I would never want someone to feel unsafe around me and I said then why do you say all of these things that are unsafe that would make someone afraid of you and he looked at me because it had never occurred to him that people could be afraid of him yeah I mean, well, particularly this question where they're asking about transgender and trans masculine men who might exhibit some forms of toxic, toxic masculinity. I think we also have to keep in mind that like to divest from societal standards is a lot of work. Right. And misogyny is everywhere. Like we're soaking it. Right. And we've made it so that casual misogyny in particular is seen as good. Right, like if you watch a romance movie, a rom-com, and I'm gonna use Twilight as an example. There's a three movie series where the hero spends most of the books threatening to kill the heroine and talking about how much he wants to drink her blood. And when he's not doing that, he's breaking into her apartment or he's holding her captive or the other hero is, you know, breaking her car so she can't leave, kissing her against her will, all of these things. That's romantic. So then we say to the folks who are going to be young adults watching those kinds of things, that's not okay at 25, but we just spent 20 years teaching you that's what love looks like. 
So yeah, you've got to have those conversations and you've got to, especially if you're talking with trans folks, and this is one of those things where that's definitely got to be an intra-community conversation. You've got to have that. This is what you're passing on. This is what you're moving forward. Is this what you want to do? Because the same folks that you have idolized also put people at risk. So let's talk about who this is that you want to be like. And it's not easy. I'm not saying this will be smooth. This will work. I'm saying this is an ongoing process. Just like, you know, when I talk about fast tail girls, we have to have those conversations with our mothers and our aunts and whatever, because they will look at you in your booty shorts and parent the things that they were told and then be upset when you and say not that even they're realize how harmful that sort of messaging is because they don't, no. you know, th this is so normal to them. Like this was a societal standard that you talk to young girls like this. And it, you know, we hadn't gotten to this national conversation or, you know, point where like you have to think about how often like we are coming into new language ourselves, new ways of saying things. Like I had to learn how to like ask for help. I didn't have the language to know how to ask. So imagine someone who's transversing, you know, their biological gender, who's saying out loud that I'm going to live differently and I'm going to define what that means. You know, all the things that they have to, you know, that has that how they've been talked to, like how radical that is, and they're going to trip up. Like thing, you know what I mean? For them to repeat things that might be harmful that they've heard in society because this is how masculinity was defined. Like, you know. and this is the other thing. None of us are perfect at this, right? We're all constantly journeying to learn how to be better people to the end of your life, right? So not to say, like I said, that some people won't just have to be left behind, but there are plenty of people who don't have to be left behind. They just need patience and help and support. And also, frankly, time. Okay, so at the end of this chapter, Reigning Patriarchy, you said that you internalized the dominant male agenda that you had been taught. Besides reading, what did you do to reverse those dominant male agenda views that you learned over the years to be more free within yourself? So one of the things was looking at what, for lack of a way of putting it, what it cost me to fit into expected boxes, right? Am I happy doing this? Do I even like this? And the answer all too often was no, right? Why does this matter to me, right? The same questioning process I encourage people to take up with folks they care. You have to ask yourself some questions. Part of the internal unpacking is looking at why you do things, right? That self-reflection of I'm judging her short skirt or her for being there at 2 a.m., but the one who did the harm was the other person. So why am I judging her? Why aren't I judging him or, or her, them, whatever? Because what you tend to realize when you start to look at it, in my case, I originally was a church kid and I broke away from all of that, is that you're conned almost into believing that what you have to do is turn yourself inside out to make other people comfortable. And then you look up one day and you don't have the life you wanted. You may not even know what the life you wanted is, but you know what you have isn't good. So how do you fix it? What do you want? And figuring out what you want, then how do you get there? And what has to be left behind along the way is a journey unto itself. Regardless of your gender presentation, you're already, for the most part, as you enter adulthood, having to figure out who you are. Then when you get into gender, and what messaging you get about your gender, you got to unpack that too. Then you got to deal with racism, right? And all of that while still going to a job, so forth, so on, right? We, we can't say, why isn't, why aren't poor people better about whatever? Why aren't those people better about whatever without acknowledging that even having the time to do that work is a form of privilege? Absolutely. Absolutely. Even like, you know, I sent out an email um, last week to the book club about that reading is a privilege, right? All these books have always been there to read, but to have the time, the mental space, the mental capacity, to have the community to dialogue with, you know, so a lot of the ways in which we're told this is how you grow and this is how you become a better person, they, they, the, the time and space for that hinges on particular privileges that all of us don't have access to. Well, and one of the things that will come up, I was saying this to someone, when we say, well, 
I don't have time to read. I don't have time for. And people say, well, of course you do. Well, you don't actually know that they do. Because just because you have a single job, your job isn't physically demanding. There are no children or the children in your house are well behaved or, you know, a dozen of other things. You don't know what's going on in someone else's life. And among other things, you don't know if reading is difficult for them. Right? Yeah. Reading is a relatively new human invention. Like math, literacy, mass literacy is relatively recent. So we can't say, well, why can't you read? And not think about they may be dyslexic, they may have vision problems, stress, whatever, focus problems, ADHD, blah, blah. I mean, and depression, also, I forgot how to spell words because my depression got so bad. So, like, you know, you just never know what a person's going through. Right. I have migraines, so I can't always look at the, the book or the page, that white page, black, if the lighting is wrong. My brain decides that now is a wonderful time to cut itself off, right? <laughs> yeah. So audiobooks, is, it is sometimes. And so that's what I tell people. I said, you have to leave space for folks for whom reading isn't easy. We understand math is hard. We don't really understand that so is deciphering the symbols that make up our words. I had never had thought about how mass literacy is a pretty recent occurrence. In my role in a corporate setting, I'm often asked, to mentor new black hires. How can I help them succeed while being their authentic selves in the workplace? So a couple things. If you're being asked to mentor regularly, that's a job role. That's a position and you should get paid for it. And I say that specifically because I've been that person and I've realized that taking on a second unpaid job makes it more difficult for you to help your mentees be good at what they want to do and who they are in the workplace. Cause you still gotta do your job and then you gotta do this other job. And then on top of that, you have to look at the culture in your corporation because sometimes you have to turn to HR and say things like we need an affinity group. We need to bring in speakers or we need to have that, that conversation about your dress code that says certain hairstyles are off limits or about the comments that Brad in accounting likes to make where he can't remember anyone's name. So he calls all the black workers Keisha or whatever, right? Like I've heard all of these things <laughs> over the years. And we have to be able to say to our mentees, to new young people, you know, this is a job. It is not your whole identity. It's not your whole you. You should come in. You should do your job. You should work to the best of your abilities. Network as best as you can. All of that. But also... And this is old school advice. Remember that some of these people are not your friends. And you need to proceed as though you are at work and not get too comfortable. Because unfortunately, you're being held to a completely different standard than Stacy. Right? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to change that standard. You shouldn't try and move up and change the culture. You should all be working together to change the culture. But while you're being your authentic self, you need to have your guard up because you might want to move to a different company. You might want to not work yeah, for anybody you else. You don't want to settle. You don't want to, you know, compromise right. your sense of self. And also, and like, you definitely want to say you're getting paid fairly. Yeah. And when I think about the whole mentor conversation, particularly to like black girls and black women, a lot of black women in power as a position, because they do do community facing work, are already stretched thin. And so mm -hmm. for those of us that are looking for mentorship, what we should do is think about what do we actually want for our mentorship? And rather than trying to find that one person be our mentor, just being better about the specific ask for help. Right, uh, ask for help. And also sometimes, I know people love a good mentor relationship, but sometimes your best success is working with the other black people at your level, the other people of color at your level. Mm -hmm. Because, right, those skill sets, that you have that they don't have and vice versa, you can teach each other those skill sets. You don't always have to go to someone else who's maybe stretched a little thinner and a little higher. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be networking, getting to know, to know people up the corporate ladder, but don't expect everything to come from above. Mm. Look around you. So going back to your chapter on Fast Tail Girls, this uh, person is saying, I grew up with the rules about not wearing short skirts and being a lady, similar to what you addressed. These things are ingrained in me, and I find myself repeating some of these things to my teen daughter, but I catch myself. 
How do we as mothers empower our daughters to be confident in their sexuality while also teaching self-protection? These two things seem like they can contradict each other. Do they? And if not, how do they coexist? So I'm going to say, and this is going to sound hard. I'm a mom of a teen. I'm going to say this, though. There's nothing she can do right that will protect her from a predator. There's nowhere she could be. There's nothing she can wear. Let that go, okay? Because we are sexually assaulted when we're children, too young to even be in a short skirt conversation, babies to to old ladies. We know um, that it can happen to anyone, anytime, including in their own homes, in their own beds. So let's remove the idea that she can craft a world where she is safe because she can't. What we can craft is a world where she, A, knows if something happens, it is not her fault. And that B, you are a safe person to come to who will help her, who will take care of her. It doesn't mean teach her to be afraid. You want to sign her up for boxing or shooting or any of that, go for it, right? Kickboxing is a great stress relief. But you should also be willing to hear her say, I did everything and stood up. Because unfortunately, the only person responsible for sexual assault is the assaulter. Rape happens because people choose to rape. It's not because of skirts, it's not because of makeup or where they were or whatever. It's because rapists exist and choose their victims. And we can't say, I'm gonna make you safe so he picks another victim. That's not how that works. What we can say is, I'm here for you no matter what. And then you can talk about, as she's learning about her body and her sexuality, where does she feel comfortable, Mm -hmm. right? Is she wearing those short skirts because she wants to, because her friends are, because she wants to get on your nerves, because that is teenage girl and her mother in a nutshell, let me get on your nerves. Ask those questions, be someone she can talk to, because ultimately, she's going to go out into the world just like you did. And she's going to have to navigate it based on her decisions. So you have to be teaching her to make her decisions that are best for her. Not so much about what wall you can build around her, what bubble you can build around her. Mm -hmm. So in your, well, in both the education and parenting while marginalized chapters, you discuss the policing and criminalization of black girls. How might we use hood feminism to help young girls develop and see their power? Although you state that on page 198, it is not up to the kids to come up with the answers. We see young people creating change often. A recent example is that of high school students in Minneapolis successfully demanding that the school board terminate the district's contract with the local police department. So the the actual question was how do we help use feminism to help young girls develop and see their power. So I think anything that includes the words divest and defund police are great. We should absolutely, right? Um, If you can't get to 100% defunding, which I know is is a lot of people's ultimate goal is abolition, I'm not sure we can get there in any rapid fashion, but I will happily take funding police like we fund schools, public schools. You'd be amazed at how sharp those budget cuts will be if they had to deal with the 1% of a city budget that many public schools do. So what we can say to kids who want to be involved and be feminists is to use their voices for what they want to see happen, to work with each other, right? Those kids were effective because there was a group of them. One kid writing that letter might not have gotten anywhere. Groups of kids coming together, planning, organizing, Um, handing out everything from masks to hand sanitizer, doing all of these things to help their community and speaking up at those school board meetings because the backstory on some of that in Minneapolis is that this was not a new demand so much as it was an ongoing conversation about police and brutality, not just in Minneapolis, but in schools in general, right? Showing up and supporting them when they show up. You can't hear your kids say, something is wrong at my school and go, oh, well, you just have to buckle down and do the work. Ask them what's wrong, right? Um, I'm gonna use my kid as an example. When he was in high school, he had a conflict with someone 
on the staff. And when we sat down to talk about the root of this conflict, because he was going to be suspended, he was going to be written up. He was getting a ticket for trespassing because he was in an empty classroom studying. I know how that sounds. I'm not going to tell you it makes more sense because I went to the school convinced that there had to be more to this story. And they told me he was trespassing in, in the empty classroom where he had class the next period out of their faces, straight faces. And when I said, well, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And here's why the ticket just evaporated. You would be amazed at what people will say to children in schools, children in general, and the things they will expect them to just go with because they know parents believe the staff before they believe the kid. That's what we're conditioned to do and think that kids aren't trustworthy. But you know your kid. Talk to your kids. Talk to your kids' friends. They will tell you all manner of things that are going on in the, in the place where they spend eight hours a day. You should listen to the people who are physically there eight hours a day, yeah. not just the people who send you a note home when they're mad. Absolutely. Like having your parents support. You know, I used to fake call like I was my mama because they talk completely different to someone when they think it's an adult than to a child. And it's like, I'm saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, pull up the right question here. In your chapter, Race, Poverty, and Politics, you discuss the importance of seeing voter suppression as a feminist issue. The chapter instantly raised questions for me about the current rise of black women in national and local electoral politics, i.e. Abrams and Presley. How might hood feminism help us to better see, support, and engage with black women's efforts to reimagine or expand the possibilities of electoral politics at the local level? So there's a couple ways. You know, there's that Emily's List way where they find and fund candidates. And I'm not saying we shouldn't also do that for black women candidates. But also, and this goes back to those boring meetings, push for at the boring meetings between elections, mail-in voting. Push for better policies around voting. Tell your Congress critter that they need to back re, 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 let, uh, certifying the voting rights amendment that they need to show up to make voting accessible, right? The polling places need to be early, open early and often, right? If we can't make voting day a holiday, we can have a two to three week window of early voting. I'm from Illinois where we already have that two week window mm -hmm. and then we have mail-in voting. Our turnout is great, right? We've seen this organized messaging that voter fraud is happening. Fun fact, it's mostly turned out to be Republicans committing the fraud they claim they're afraid of. Yes, or just well, racist need, politics in general, but yeah. Right. We need, to, we need to see black voters, black electoral politics that focus on access to voting all the time, not just for presidential elections. I mean, from the dog catcher to the city treasurer, you need to be making sure that your state hears what you want is, let's say, a two to three week window around each election where you can early vote and that those votes are physical and counted and not easily manipulatable in the machine or whatever, mail-in votes, all of that. And also volunteering to be election judges, to do all of these things. I know that it's a scary time right now, but we're partially here because so many of the people involved in our process are able to do it without any checks and balances. There aren't enough people getting involved in the boring in-between process of voting in politics. So if you've got time, and I mean, even if it's just two days a month, one night a month, show up, remind them that you're there. And here's a fun fact, public servants work for you, not the other way around. Yeah. I mean, and part of it is if you wanna see particularly more progressive black women candidates, you know, I did a dinner about a year out before Stacey Abrams ran for governor where I met her. And I remember I had gone to like, a, there's Annie's List, which is, I had gone to an Annie's List event when I was living in Texas. And, um, and I was in the Dallas area and there had been a few Latinx women who had successfully made it to the state legislature. And they were giving a talk about what was required to get them to that point. And it was basically community support. They needed people like to, not even just financially, but like the emotional, the physical support because of the way the state legislature was uh, set up in Texas that pretty much only wealthy people could run. 
Um, and so I remember asking Ava, I was like, you know, it's, a, it's kind of like a personal sacrifice as a black woman to run for office. You know, I read that Marilyn Mosby piece, and the one thing I was like, oh, I hope her marriage makes it, because it just, it sounded so rough. Um, I, I I know people want Abrams to run for VP, and this is going to sound crazy. I like her so much, I almost don't want her to run for VP, because I'm so <laughs> concerned. About her personal about what, well-being. What <laughs> right. And I, cause I can't say to anyone that I expect them when everybody was like, well, Michelle Obama should run. And I said, Michelle Obama, my Michelle from 87. You know, what's oh, funny. Michelle. Y'all, y'all sound alike on y'all audio books. It's a very, it might, it might be a Chicago thing, but I was yes. like, oh, like, cause I had this, when I read, when I did Becoming, I had to like speed through it. Cause I had an interview with her coming up. So I had to like, and she reads so slow on her audio. Bless her heart. But when I sped it up, you sound like her, like 1.25. <laughs> and I was like, this must be like a Chicago thing. Because I was cracking up like y'all have the same inflection. <laughs> and, and you know what? And it's true because there's a South Side Chicago accent that we probably share. But this is the thing. When you're talking about running for office, yo, this is a cesspool. We've made politics so bad that when we say, why can't we get good people? Good people don't want to go in there. Good people don't want to do this to their day, I mean, their life. Abrams has, I think Abrams, you know, I'm okay with her being VP because it seems like she really wants to be VP. And when I had right, that conversation with her, I got her. yeah, uh, she, she I, acknowledged that she kind of sacrificed having a family because she wanted to be involved in politics. And black women just don't get supported the same way uh, women from other communities are supported in running for political positions and also having partners um, who will do some of the domestic work and like, you know, <laughs> take lead raising the kids. <laughs> I'm going to say this as someone whose partner has actually been super supportive. Mm-hmm. Um, I sometimes want to tell folks, however he acts or she acts when you're dating, that's who they are. Mm-hmm. Because the person who won't, this is a mundane and petty thing. When you're getting ready for bed and the light is still on and you say you're real tired and your feet hurt and the other person won't lean over and turn off that light, won't kill the bug, won't take care of you. And I mean, we're talking petty, mundane ways. Won't pull their share of the weight. I was married to one like that and divorced them. Mm-hmm. What they're telling you is that this, a life with me, I'm never going to have your back. I know we veered into relationship chat, but let me just say as someone who got divorced and remarried and sits outside some of these conversations about how you can get your partner to pull half, to do half, because my partner does, we sometimes don't realize that a person who's not kind and giving on the tiny front is not going to be giving or supportive when things get hard. And I know none of us has a crystal ball, but in retrospect, if I had been able to go back and tell 20 year old me, that man won't won't give you a hug when you're crying because he's mad at you. Leave him. Yes, please don't do that to yourself. That, ooh. Right. Ooh, okay. (laughs) So on the scope of voting, how can we get black non-voters to believe in voting again. So this is why I keep talking about the boring in between process. It does no good to tell people to vote if in between nothing changes. Mm-hmm. So I want to hear, um, I'm sorry, my phone is blowing up because Hillary Clinton just put me on her story on Instagram. Oh, well, so, congratulations. Yeah, I hope you get so like, gonna... you know, they're really doing that sh- share with black women. They're taking the hashtag seriously. Yes. She's like posting my book. Okay. Uh, my friend is going off. She's like, what are you doing? No, I'm sorry. Um, but I'm going to say that this is the part, the in-between part, because if the food stamps, if the utility bills, if the job programs, if the schools, if the, and I'm not, and I'm not saying like only black people are on food stamps because Lord knows we're not even the majority users. I'm saying it like if we're not taking care of the basic needs and making sure people can access those basic things, and then we say, come vote. Well, People feel like nothing changes for them because functionally for the poorest people in our communities, nothing changes. Things get slightly better or slightly worse, but statistically speaking, 
we're at that same dollar fifty six per meal or dollar fifty seven or so per meal from food stamps. We're at the same cuts to public housing and the same dilapidated idea of what a school building should look like, regardless of who's in the White House, because we're not making sure that these things are happening in Congress with our mayors, with our governors, with our state legislators. And so if we want non-voters to get involved, we've got to show up for them the way we want them to show up for us. We've got to have candidates that, among other things, don't just talk about the middle class. Candidates who open their mouth and talk about what they'll do for people who are in low income communities, who are in communities that are underserved. Because if you are going, I just saw this in Georgia, it's going to take you 14 hours to vote. Or do you come back and vote in the next election? Do you? I feel like maybe you don't do that. Even if you think you're going to in the moment, even if you stuck it out that day, you are one job where you can't afford to miss those hours away from not going to vote. So we have to show up for the people who don't vote. We have to be looking at everything from, you know, making minimum wage a living wage because I've just recently found out what minimum wage is. Again, I somehow make myself forget it every time because it upsets me so much. And balance that with, if I want you to come to the voting booth, what's in that voting booth for you? What will, what will you leave feeling like you'll get? What issues are on that ballot? Not just with candidates, but what issues? Are we voting a referendum to fund schools? Are we voting in something to subsidize um, child, child care or bus, you know, public transit? What are we voting for? Because if there's nothing on offer for me in that voting booth but more poverty, do I keep going back to the booth? I still got the poverty either way. It's true, and it's just, yeah. Man, it's a, it's a little frightening, you know, like the ways in which they're going after this voter suppression. And the idea is this, even if we overwhelm them this year, are they ensuring that we don't come back out next year or the years right. after? Right. All right, this is the last question, and we'll let you go celebrate. They said Zerlina Maxwell took over Hillary Clinton's Instagram, so you can go celebrate the amplification and all the things you deserve. But do yes. you find it difficult having to become an ally or a defendant for those marginalized spaces in which you were not familiar with in your upbringing or current life? And if so, how did you navigate that? And do you still have trouble challenges now? Did I ask this earlier? Yes, you did. Oh, well, maybe that was our last question. <laughs> I don't know how I put that on here twice. I was like, wait, I've already asked this. I did. Whoever that was my that was my well that was the last question. <laughs> we covered we everything. Tell us, <laughs> we had to tell us and we made it work. It did. Thank you for joining. Thank you for everyone who tuned in. We really enjoyed reading this book. It's great. Everyone, I don't, I, everyone loves this book. So thank you so thank much. You. We're happy for all your success, and thank you everyone for joining. We're gonna log off now. All y'all have a good night. Bye. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye-bye.